An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno, Lecture 19, July 29th, 1958. Ladies and Gentlemen, In the last session, we had begun to address the problem of definition, and as you may recall, I had specifically drawn attention to the difference between two possible ways of, determ of determining a concept, namely the deictic approach, which refers us directly to object intended by the concept and the definitional approach. This distinction belongs, of course, to traditional epistemological theory, and you may justifiably ask what such an elementary point is doing in a series of lectures about the dialectic, although I must confess that I am not always sure that the principles and assumptions of traditional logic and epistemology are always as present as they should be to those who specifically like to develop a dialectical logic, so that we cannot perhaps completely dispense with the occasional recapitulation of such issues. But however things stand in this regard, I mentioned this distinction precisely in order to introduce you to a whole series of expressly dialectical problems. For it is quite evident that recourse to the deictic approach is only possible, can only really be accomplished at all in a very small proportion of cases. Whereas, whereas with more complex concepts, which are embedded in a much broader context, such deictic reference is impossible. And that not only because it would presuppose an endless regress, but because quantity here also springs over into quality. Thus, if we, add to show, if we had to show by direct reference to the object itself, let us say, what class or what society is, and both are concepts which reflective investigation cannot do without, we would certainly find ourselves at a loss, not simply because it would require an endlessly mediated process in order, to, in order actually to show people what class is, but also and preeminently because these concepts themselves are so complexly structured, because the categorical moments are so predominant here that we cannot get away simply by referring or pointing to the object or state of affairs in question. And as a rule, these are precisely the concepts which, as philosophers and especially Hegel and Nietzsche have objected, effectively elude definition because they involve a historical content which cannot be reified or tied down, as it were, which cannot be straightforwardly related to other concepts without those concepts forfeiting all determinacy in the process. This problem arises directly wherever the relationship between dialectical thought and concepts in general is concerned, and this whole complex of issues involved in definition is very difficult to separate from the complex of issues involved in the question of the relationship to conceptuality, conceptuality as such. Thus, while concepts cannot be sworn to a determinate content in such a way that everything else that it brings with it is thereby simply excluded from the concept itself, our concepts must still possess a certain determinacy, sui generis. And from this perspective, and you will have seen how I have always attempted in these lectures, to introduce you to what dialectic actually means from a fresh perspective each time. You can look upon the dialectic, if it may here be regarded from once as a method, as a way of thinking which expressly does justice to this distinctive character of the concept, since it refuses either to treat the latter as simply vague and indeterminate, or alternatively to arrest its movements by an arbitrary recourse to definition. I would indeed generally encourage a certain skepticism on your part regarding the whole procedure of definition, not merely for the kind of epistemological reasons which have become sufficiently evident in the course of these lectures, but also if you will permit me this metabasis ace allogenos for moral reasons. I have been able to observe on repeated occasions that when someone insists in the course of a discussion that it is necessary to, to define this concept before we can really talk about it. This involves a wish to evade responsibility, as it were, for the concept in question, and that the impulse behind this insistence on defining concepts rather smacks of the sophistry which imagines that it can evade genuine 
reflection on the matter and responsibility for the issues involved by manipulating all conceptual devices available. Thus, if you are engaged in a discussion about the entire complex of guilt regarding the concentration camps, and someone tries to postpone the discussion by saying, before we can discuss the concept of guilt at all, we must first be entirely clear about how we actually define the concept of guilt here. There's already something unspeakably obtuse and even malignant about this in view of the fact of Auschwitz, namely a certain tendency to conjure away the thing itself. Through the seeming intellectual freedom and scholarly sobriety with which we aim to ensure a well-grounded judgment about the issue involved. And I believe this leads to something else, the generally accepted and frequently defended view that we first bestow meaning on concepts precisely through definition. That concepts are in effect, therefore arbitrary, subjective products that do not really stand up. That which appears to us and the concepts with which we generally operate as a vague horizon of associations is not, or at least not entirely, something contingent, something merely constituted in and through the subject, but something which is always also harbored in the concept itself, certainly not unambiguously contained there, certainly contained there in a potentially aberrant form, and certainly exposed to all kinds of potential misinterpretations and merely subjective interpretations. Nonetheless, it is a nominalist error to believe that every concept we employ is a tabula rasa, which can be transformed into a richly furnished table only by virtue of our definitions. If that were really so, then all meaningful speech, indeed language itself, would be impossible, and you will repeatedly be able to observe how those who speak ex cathedra in a scholarly or scientific capacity are still by no means inclined to entrust themselves simply, simply to that other language, the language of definitions, as if its concepts already involved or provided something meaningful in itself. This aspect of language, namely the way that concepts always already bring something to us that we do not ourselves first produce, something which we must already accept, as it were, along with language itself. This is precisely what is inhibited by the need for, de for definition. The concept that has not specifically been defined, namely the word itself that is initially acknowledged just as I receive it, brings a greater wealth of the objectivity which it intends than the definition which effectively excises what the word contains in order to, in order to serve the idol of security, the indubitable concept which henceforth stands at its disposal. Now the art or task which the use of concepts in any dialectical method sets before us is precisely to preserve what is contained in every concept rather than to excise it or to conceal it through arbitrary posits and stipulations of our own. It is to become aware of this content. Um, as such, so that it may emerge from its initial ambiguity and problematic vagueness but this comes about not through definition, but by virtue of the constellation into which our concepts are drawn. And this brings us back to our earlier insight that the concept of truth is not fulfilled in relation to any one particular moment of cognition, that no particular cognition can redeem its whole truth, since each refers back and relates back to every other. I think I can, I think I can illustrate what I am driving at here by reference to a relatively simple kind of experience something to which I also alluded in my piece, the essay as form, a text that is particularly relevant in this connection. I am referring to the situation of someone who wants to learn a foreign language without participating in the blessing of the curse of regular instruction in school or other institution. I imagine that such a person will broach a text in the foreign language with a certain enthusiasm even though he is probably familiar with only a rather limited number of concepts, with the auxiliary verbs or a range of other plastic expressions, for example. But once he has read a certain word 30 times, its sense will become clear to him from the specific context in which it appears. He is eventually able to extrapolate its meaning in further contexts, but he will also probably be capable in the end of appreciating an even greater wealth of meaning 
when the word is transformed in the context of varying constellations, something that is generally close to us if we simply look up the relevant word in a dictionary. You only need to try looking up some concept or other in the dictionary, and then looking up the same concept in a thesaurus to appreciate all that the concept in question involves and what it does not immediately involve, to see how much this life of, co of concepts fully unfolds within a constellation rather than in isolation. On the other hand, we must also say, of course, that while the concept only assumes determinacy through the varying constellations into which it enters and only reveals its life in this process, the concept also changes at the same time. In other words, the particular value that any concept assumes at each new position, if we are not dealing simply with relatively primitive and undifferentiated terms that are drawn from the world of things, amounts to a transformation of the meaning, which the word enjoys in a different position. And the crucial thing where an appropriate relationship to language is concerned, it seems to me, is that we have both aspects at the same time. On the one hand, with a, with a precise view of the concept, or I would almost say with an obstinate insist insistence on the concept, we become as precisely aware as possible of what it intends. While on the other hand, we also become aware of the transformation which the concept undergoes. In this way, we grasp the concept as both internally determinate and susceptible to transformation. Concepts are not arbitrary in character. They already possess a kind of firm core, and in a sense, the change they involve transpires in relation to this firm core, but at the same time, they actually possess no static content and constitute a process within themselves. Every concept is indeed internally dynamic, and the task is somehow to do justice to this dynamic character. And here it is often enough language itself that will have to furnish the canon for the appropriate use of concepts. I do not want you to, to misunderstand me here. These critical observations on the practice of definition are not meant to encourage an arbitrary approach to concepts. For what I have been suggesting to you here, I would like to say, is precisely an attempt to become aware of the concept itself in a much more binding way than is available to mere definition. Nor is it my intention simply to impugn the, the practice of definition as such. And realizing how easy it is to turn such thoughts into nothing but a series of taboos or warning lights, I would not wish to frighten you away from definition in principle. And not only because I worry as a result that the jurists and economists among you would soon encounter serious difficulties in the academic context, something for which I would not like to bear responsibility. For I believe that definitions can play a part in philosophy and indeed specifically in philosophy with emphatic claims. And even, and even must play a certain part in this context, but then such definitions, I would still argue, are radically different in kind from the verbal definitions, which are generally required in the business of the sciences, where the reification of things accomplished by science takes precedence over the experience of the thing itself. Perhaps for the sake of clarity, although I would not like you to imagine that I am ascribing too much importance to this particular example, I could offer you a definition which I myself once deployed in minima moralia, and which may show you what I am trying to say with these observations, and what I really understand by definition. For there I claimed in short that art is magic, which is delivered from the lie of being truth. If someone does not already know what a work of art is, if we may assume there are people who are unresponsive to art, and there are such people as we know, then a definition such as this will certainly not tell this person what it is. And if the concept of art is not already bound up with a host of other living ideas in the mind of such a person, then this definition will certainly provide no further help. Thus, if we wish to clarify for ourselves without already possessing any idea of art, precisely what art is, and are then informed, while well, art is magic delivered from the lie of being truth, this definition will naturally leave us high and dry. But unless I am deceived here, I would argue there is a higher sense in which a definition such as this is superior to the more standard and widespread definitions of art, such as the notion that art is a sensuous form or structure which lies beyond the world of immediate practical ends,
and purposes, but is simultaneously experienced as meaningful in itself, and other similar approaches, and it is superior to these precisely because a definition such as the one I have proposed can prove illuminating for someone who already has some conception of art, can suddenly intensify all of the elements involved in a way that transcends any merely static or two-dimensional conception of what a work of art is, and thus reveals something of the imminently dynamic character of what the work of art as a process actually ought to be. Whereas I would say the other more static definitions, such as the one which I have just mentioned, which is by no means the worst of them, are essentially flawed because that feature of lying beyond immediate ends, for example, can only properly be grasped, can only really speak to us. It would, if we clearly recognize the dialectic of the useful and the useless in a world that is disfigured by utility. Definitions such as this, therefore, can only become genuinely meaningful once we fully acknowledge this moment. And something similar, for example, also holds for Walter Benjamin's definition of fate as the nexus of guilt among the living, a statement which naturally will be of little help to anyone who is not already aware of fate, of those moments of blind necessity and menace that are necessarily involved in the thought of fate, of the interconnected character of events, all those things which come to gather round such a definition as if it were a magnet. And I would say that the sense and point of definitions, of philosophical definitions, i.e. of definitions in a higher intellectual sense of the word, is precisely to generate such magnetic fields without arresting the movement of concepts. In other words, these definitions serve expressly to release the life that is already harbored in the concepts themselves, to release the power that is still preserved in them, to release these concepts as so many fields of force. And if it is precisely the task of dialectic to transform what is given in reified form, to transform the merely existent into a force field of, the, of this kind, then we might even ascribe definition in this higher sense of the instrument par excellence of dialectical thinking. And perhaps the reason why dialectical thought is especially allergic to the vulgar use of definition is precisely that it violates what philosophy must achieve at the end by placing what can only be a result and a process right at the beginning. Perhaps I can also say something else here about these definitions, which I have been encouraging you to reflect upon and which, as I hope to show you, do not just crop up in the writings of dialectical thinkers by accident, as it were, but are fundamentally bound up with the nature of their thought. For an essential moment and distinctive feature of these definitions is their concentration. The highly pointed character of such formulations brings them into specific tension with the extensive character of the actual process which they present for us. And this specific contradiction which they embody, the contradiction between something inconceivably extended and something inconceivably intensified is the flame, so to speak, through which this kind of dialectical definition is able to perform its illuminating role. In other words, such definitions are not to be taken a la lettre, as if these were mere conceptual determinations. Rather, I would almost like to say what we need to recognize here is the gentle moment of implicit irony, which lies in the way the very formulation intensifies the most extensive content in terms of some proposition, which essentially narrows that content without thereby being taken for the matter in its entirety. Rather, the sole purpose of this intensification is to bring out the life implicitly at work in the matter itself. The stylistic ideal of dialectical definition would thus be a Tacitian one, and this type of definition is infinitely preferable to the sort of mere conceptual determination and manipulation of concepts which is deployed in framing research projects, for example. Definition as this is usually understood, the type of definition which flourishes today in particular, is what is known as operational definition. And although I do not regard it as my task in these lectures to examine the contemporary positivist conception of logic, I would still like to say something, especially for the sociologists among you, about this operational concept of, def of definition. It is certainly the case whenever we work with the kind of reified methods which are effectively modeled on the procedures of the natural sciences, 
that we cannot simply dispense with definitions in the usual sense. And the point of my remarks here is not so much to disabuse you of this necessary tendency as to encourage you to reflect upon these modes of procedure, which may well have their topos nautic nauticos within the accepted practices of the special sciences, but not to ascribe some absolute status to them or not to confuse them with the source of truth. An operational definition is one where the concept in question is determined by the operations undertaken to secure the applicability of the concept in relation to some specific material. Thus, if you were ever to carry out an investigation into social prejudice, God help you, you would find yourselves in the position of having to present your experimental subject with a series of 10 propositions. For example, and you would be expected to identify the occurrence of specific prejudices by applying a, qu a quantitative method to these propositions as an interrelated totality. You will define the relevant prejudice simply as a mathematical value within the numerical analysis of the responses provided to each proposition, so that someone who scores a numerical value of plus five in relation to specific propositions, for example, is regarded as a prejudiced individual, while someone who scores negative five is regarded as an unprejudiced one. You will thereby naturally have ensured that you do not get into any awkward difficulties with your investigative procedures. That is to say, if you encounter any criticism, you can always claim that what you understand by prejudice in such an investigation is precisely this state of affairs which has been mathematically determined in this way. But I would argue that this procedure is vulnerable to criticism in a higher sense. I would like at least to indicate some of the reasons behind such criticism. The point of a definition in this, in the philosophical sense would have to be this, that the, determ that the determination of a concept sheds a kind of light, as I like to put it, that allows us to see what actually constitutes the life of this concept, what effectively stands behind the concept in question. In other words, a genuine or productive definition would have to be a synthetic definition. It would have to furnish something new beyond what is already contained in the concept, would relate it to something new that has not already been thought, and by virtue of this very relation would bring what we already know to speak. But this synthetic moment is what is excised in principle by an operational definition. Such a definition is in effect nothing but, or to put it bluntly, is effectively a, tot a tautology. That is, it is defined solely in terms of the means used to determine it, and thus actually says nothing at all over and beyond what it, what it is directly applied to. And in the second place, we would have to say, as I already suggested in our criticism of the concept of definition, that the concept is treated here as if it were, a, were simply a tabula rasa, that is, as something which actually brings nothing at all to us in its own right. Thus, the concept is exposed instead to a kind of arbitrary determination on our part, and it is indeed one of the best known paradoxes of all non-dialectical thinking that the more such scienti scientific and non-dialectical thought claims to attain to so-called objectivity, the more its determinations reveal themselves to be merely subjective in character. The passion for objectification always effectively leads to the predicament where everything that properly belongs to the object, everything in which the object itself has an essential and constitutive part, is stripped from the object and in a sense now located solely within the subject. The older forms of positivism, that of Hume, or also of Mach and Avenarius, also clearly admitted as much, and thus developed an essentially rather subjectivist theory of knowledge whereas more recent forms of positivism exhibit tremendous virtuosity precisely in denying this latent subjectivist moment, although they fall victim to it all the more emphatically. In other words, if you define prejudice as the behavior of an individual who provides the answers A, B, C, and D to propositions 1, 2, and 3, 1, 2, 3, and 4, such an interpretation would only be meaningful if you already possess a theory which goes beyond these propositions which also situates the statements which constitute the, the definition, irrespective of the quantitative relationship through which the definition is arrived at in a certain theoretical context. 
which could develop, for example, a social psychological model for individuals who responded in precisely this way, rather than that because they exhibit a rather specific, if nonetheless complex, kind of character structure. If you do not proceed in such a way, you actually falsify the life, which also inhabits a concept such as prejudice. If in God's name you wish to employ this concept for once, and if you continue talking about prejudice in this case, you fail to capture what the expression prejudice intrinsically signifies. The problem I have been talking about here is by no means simply an innocuous one, and by no means simply an epistemological subtlety, as it might initially appear to you once we proceed to employ operationally defined concepts in this way over and beyond their operational definition, which is what always happens. Which is, which is what also happened, for example, in the authoritarian personality at this particular point. In other words, you will repeatedly find that once a concept has been operationally defined, and this not merely through some intellectual error, but for reasons which are deeply rooted in the matter itself, what such a quantified value of prejudice effectively means already gets smuggled in, even though the operational definition would actually exclude this use of a concept beyond what is strictly defined by it. And if we proceeded in this way in the context of the authoritarian personality, which I cannot exactly regard as a masterpiece of dialectical logic, this was perhaps justified by the fact that the individual statements which were employed for the operational definition of the prejudiced character, for example, were framed in terms of a basically coherent theory, so that meaningful extrapolation was at least possible in this case. But it strikes me as highly doubtful whether the same could be said for the great majority of similar social psychological investigations. I pointed out earlier that the problem of definition is basically one with the problem concerning the position of the dialectic with regard to universal concepts. And here I come to an objection which has repeatedly been raised against dialectical thought, and which I imagine is also still familiar to several of you. You have learned from these lectures, and especially from our critique of definitions, that purely isolated universal concepts are not really defensible, and insofar as you have not fully grasped the motivating impulse here, and fail to see beyond the surface of what I have been saying, it may well strike some of you, in spite of my best efforts to prevent this, as if this simply amounts to the relativizing of our concepts. And those of you who make this assumption will then easily be able to say, there we have it, you constantly impugn universal concepts. You say we shouldn't hypostasize them, shouldn't arbitrarily restrict them, shouldn't arbitrarily tie them down, but you yourself also need these universal concepts all the time. You cannot possibly dispense with the universal, and if you even attempted to do so, then you would simply, as Paul Tillich once put, to, put it to me, end up saying nothing beyond that there, and would no longer be justified in making any meaningful or comprehensive assertion about anything. So I would like to repeat emphatically here that of course dialectical thought cannot dispense with universal and, con and comprehensive concepts either, and moreover that such thought constantly employs concepts characterized by an extremely high level of abstraction. It is even the case, in contrast to the positivist perspectives adopted in the social sciences in North America, for example, that dialectical thought is all too easily accused of deploying overly general and sweeping concepts, of clinging to the concept of society itself, for example. Whereas critical sociological thought would never permit us to use the concept of society itself as a whole, but would recommend it instead that we stick exclusively to concepts which can be empirically substantiated namely concepts which move in a kind of intermediate realm in this regard, which certainly possess a certain theoretical power in relation to what is immediately conceptualized through them, but which can effectively be replaced in turn with givens without going beyond this realm in any essential, i.e. qualitative sense. But to this we must reply, the whole argument here is not about whether we can deploy universal concepts or not, Dialectic is not a form of nominalism, but nor again is it a form of realism. For these twin theses of traditional philosophy, the notion that the concept enjoys substantial being 
in relation to the individuals which it grasps and includes, and the alternative notion that the individual is substantially real, while the concept is merely a flatus vosis, or simply empty sound and smoke, these two conceptions must both be subjected to dialectical critique. In other words, for dialectical thought, there is conceptual being solely in relation to some determinate factical being, and likewise there is factical being only as being that is mediated through cognition, and cognition cannot be thought otherwise than as conceptual cognition. Neither of these two moments, therefore, can simply be exchanged in favor of the other. Both must be grasped in their necessary reciprocal, reciprocal relationship. As separate, they must indeed be distinguished from one another, cannot simply be identified or collapsed with one another, but neither of them can be turned into an absolute either. The point here, and this is all I want to say to you about this controversy today, is not to, is not to insist, given we are using some universal concepts or other, that we must now say B because we have said A, that all conceptual existence ultimately belongs in a platonic mundus intellig intelligibilis, where the investigation of the most universal concepts assumes a kind of ontological priority in comparison with the other essentially inferior realm. Thus we are already forced to adopt an ontology simply by employing concepts at all, for everything which is not ontology would then be just pure nominalism, would be reduced to pure there-there. It is precisely the task of dialectical thought to overcome this divergence, this external and unmediated disparity between these two logically possible extremes, which itself finds particularly drastic expression in the external juxtaposition of the schools of ontology and positivism, which we see today. The, the position we adopt with regard to, con to concepts is neither an attempt to legitimate them by recourse to a realm of highest and absolute concepts independent of any actual beings, nor an attempt to legitimate them by treating them merely as an external caste or dissolving them into the things they encompass. Rather, the task of philosophy is specifically to display the interdependence of these concepts in each case, to display both the unity and the variety which is involved in them. But to say that this B is derived from that A, to say that when I use any general concepts, I must also use the highest conceivable universal concepts, to which I must then ascribe an absolute dignity in the sense of the proposition. If you say A, you must also say B. All this seems to me to be an element of the kind of fettered thought which dialectic is, is expressly called upon to challenge. It seems to me to be an expression of that compulsive character of thinking, which demands that once a thought is moving in one direction, it must always continue in the same direction in order finally to lay hold of something. Absolute, whereas due reflection on this very movement actually reveals instead that there is no such absolute first and no such absolute last. But I would emphatically ask you to remember in all of this that our concepts can affirm this kind of partial substantiality that I have talked about only as long as we refuse to treat them as mere products of the process of abstraction, as long as we recognize that they always already mean something in themselves, mediated as they are by history, and that in being possessed of such meaning in themselves, they are, they are also necessarily related to one another. I have expended a considerable amount of criticism upon phenomenology, and perhaps some all too destructive criticism at that, but today I would like to do justice to phenomenology after all, and point out that it was a merit of Husserl's, but also of his successors, that with their attempt to provide an objective analysis of the meaning of concepts, they actually strove to grasp this moment we have been talking about here strove not simply to inject meaning into the concepts in subjective constitution by recourse to mere intuition, but to grasp meaning as something which already inhabits them in each case. But they then fell into the mistake of fetishizing this objective moment, of objective meaning of conceptual content in turn, of arresting it, of turning it into something that enjoys a kind of absolute existence in itself,
In other words, the mistake of not fully grasping the dialectic of universal in particular.